singly, jointly, and in their respective capacity. But before we get into that, what I would like to just mention briefly is the conclusions that we draw yesterday at the United Nations special, special session that was called by the Secretary General, and for which uh, Secretary General Gutierrez had asked uh, the United Nations cousin, the IMF, uh, to do a little bit of work to figure out what fiscal space would be needed for those countries that need to reach the Sustainable Development Goals. And what we did is a study of the 49 low-income and developing countries to determine by 2030 how much annual fiscal space would be needed for them to reach the goals. Uh, good morning, we're delighted to have you. I'm, I'm just finishing an introduction and then I'll move to you, Minister, but that gives you time to breathe and <laughs> settle in the seat. So what we, what we, found, what we did was uh, study the 49 low-income and developing countries, take five uh, pilot countries to sort of test the assumptions and the methodology that we used in order to assess the numbers. And what, you know, we've, we find out is number two, sorry, number one, 14% uh, of GDP is going to be needed in terms of fiscal space by the low-income and developing countries in order to reach the Sustainable Development Goals. 14% of GDP. That's a massive number by their account. It's not a massive number by the global uh, GDP uh, account, but for them it's a big number. And it's one that they will not be able to reach all by themselves. So, my second point is the following. Work begins at home. And what we found out in that study is that there is a need for additional capacity development. There is a need for much better uh, tax uh, design and collection. When you think of a country like Nigeria, for instance, where the uh, uh, tax to GDP is in the range is below 5%, when every, by all accounts 15% is the desired number in order to assure uh, enough public spending on common goods for the country. So capacity development, uh, fiscal capacity and with the implementation at it, which means designing, collecting, removing exemptions. And third, most importantly, which has been identified by many, is the proper governance that actually deals with corruption and with the design of a business-friendly universe in which the private sector is happy to invest and to thrive. So works begin, work begins at home. Second part, all hands on deck are going to be needed. And I'm delighted to have with us a fantastic panel, and we're going to at least assess what hands uh, they can lend in order to participate in the uh, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So I will introduce the panel very quickly. They are all, as I said, highly uh, reputable, respected um, luminary in their respective fields. Uh, we are lucky to have as a substitute to the President of the Republic of Ghana, uh, Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado. Uh, he is Minister of Development and Planning. Thank you very much for joining us. We have Bill McGlashan, who is the founder and managing partner of TPG Growth. And we have Anne Finucan, who is the Vice Chairman of Bank of America and Chairman of the Board of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch Europe, Bank of America USA, and in charge of a particular portfolio that she will detail for us later. And we have Sunil Bharti Mittal, who is the chairman of Bharti Enterprises India, one of the largest telecommunication uh, company in the world, and a member of the International Business Council, and currently still, although soon to finish his term, head of the International uh, Chamber of Commerce. Now, I'm going to start with the high representative of Ghana, Excellency, and I'm assuming that you are familiar with all the themes that I've just mentioned. You're familiar with the objectives, you're familiar with the fiscal distance that separates today's situation from 2030's attainable goals, and I hope you agree with me that all hands must be on deck, and that uh, measures have to be taken by the countries themselves. Can you detail that for us? And what I'm particularly interested in is how do you manage to reconcile the long and medium term objectives and the short term imperatives of the budget, the next election, or as Jean-Claude Juncker once famously put it, 
we know exactly what to do, but we don't know how to do it and be re-elected at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. I think I'm on, yeah. Thank you so very much. Actually, the president is still at the UNGA, and he asked me to come quickly to, 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 to stand in for him. You know, what we, have, uh, what we are doing in Ghana is that uh, in order for us, we know very well that uh, the Millennium uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals will be very expensive to, to, to handle, but at the same time, too, we've tried very much to ensure that we use the budgetary process to start kicking off. First of all, what we've done is that you know, our coordinated program, that is the, 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 national, the, the plan that we have developed in the country, really is in, embedded in that is the sustainable development goals. And so an attempt to you know, implement the budget is in indirectly implementation of the SDGs. That is the way that we've looked at it in the short run, you know, using the budgetary allocations to do that over the short period. Um, but in the long run, we know very well that uh, it's not going to be very easy for us because the finances, our, uh, our fiscal space is just very little like that. And therefore, there's the need to increase uh, uh, the resource mobilization internally. And what we're trying to do internally is to ensure that, you know, just as we rightly said, our, debt, uh, our uh, uh, tax to GDP ratio is less than 20%, about 16, 17%. So we intend to move it further to about 20, 25% so that we can, we, can, we can have more resources for that. What, what timing do you have for that? Because I think the medium term and the planning uh, are important. Yes, uh, the, the, the shorter term will be the budget, but the medium term is within, you know, we have a mandate of four years and we have to be, we have to deliver within that four years. So our medium term is a, a four year period. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing is that, you know, within this four year period, we have already had about one and a half of that. Within that period, we should be able to move our, uh, uh, our tax to GDP ratio to that level. And again, you know, um, we need to also expand the base, yeah. the tax base, which we're trying to do now by um, uh, a lot of our, 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 our uh, businesses are in the informal sector. So we need to formalize them by coming out with a way to identify where they are so that we can, they, they can also be brought into the tax net. So that is the way to, to, to broaden the base. And of course, to make every I mean, uh, uh, taxation fairer for everybody, some other taxes will have to be, will be imposed, especially uh, we've started with one that is about, uh, I mean, taxing uh, luxury uh, uh, vehicles that are imported into the country, you know, about a certain uh, 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 cubic capacity, so that we can also draw those uh, taxes into the, into the, into the thing. But, even all that, we still feel that we cannot really uh, 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 achieve what we want to achieve under the, uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals because the resources will still be very yeah. little. Yeah. So we may have to find other alternatives of you know, generating uh, uh, resources to support, to augment what we have. And we are doing that, you know, of course, everybody is turning to the private sector. Yes, we are also uh, turning to the private sector using our policies. We have a special policy that we are referring to as one district, one factory, where we want to uh, uh, decentralize industrialization. So every district will have to have one factory where you use uh, local uh, raw materials, you know, add value to them. But that will be done by the private sector, facilitated by government. So the decisions are made at the district level uh, decisions for that actually emanates from the center, but it's actually uh, 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 the, the district people are involved in the process. Mm -hmm. So it is maybe uh, trying to have a harmony between centralization and decentralization. Okay, one more question. Uh, I understand what you're trying to do in terms of tax and, and fiscal space, and I think that's very, very laudable. Um, by the way, Ghana was the first country to cut poverty in half. Uh, when it, uh, it reached the um, 
Millennium Development Goals. So when you put your mind to it, my goodness, the Ghanaians are really efficient. Sure. How do you, and then I will ask Bill to address the same topic from his perspective, how do you deal with the risk of poor governance slash corruption risks when you multiply the levels of decisions and implementation with central decisions and then district levels being involved as well? Yeah, corruption is a, a major problem that we face in, in the country. And uh, we have, first of all, come out with uh, an independent prosecutor who will actually prosecute, especially those who are involved in uh, uh, corruption, corrupt practices in, in, term, in government and in, in, in the public services. So we have that one. The law has been passed. We've actually created the office, and they've started trying to ensure that you know, we don't, we don't uh, we, uh, those who, who, who have uh, fall foul be prosecuted. But more importantly, to prevent it. So we have uh, uh, our um, procurement laws in place and we have created a ministry in charge of local procurement who is to monitor what other ministries do in terms of their procurement processes. And more importantly, you know, one major area where we, 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 we think uh, 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 people are very <laughs> that word corrupt, corrupt, but at the same time to also affect our industrialization and our de development process is the port. The revenues are the port. Um, and the invoicing, a whole lot of other things that go on there so that we don't really get what we need from the port. So what we are doing is that uh, we've, we've started to make it paperless, not to, allow, to reduce the human intervention in, in actually uh, 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 between the importer and So technology uh, plays a role in that? Technology plays a key role in much, that? Very okay, much so. we have to remember <laughs> that when I come to you, yeah, Sunil. Very much okay. so. so we are trying to use that to remove the, 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 the human uh, uh, interventions. interventions. Right. Which okay. will enable us to minimize. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, uh, do you apply transparency to a great length, particularly in relation to procurement? Is it yes. visible to all? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the procurement law actually stipulates how you go about, you know, doing the uh, procurement, uh, going through mm -hmm. the procurement processes. So yes, very transparent. You have to advertise. You have to have a committee that looks at it. We have to. So all these processes are in place, and that is why what we want to do to really ensure that, you know, I mean, this pilferage in the in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the public purse is actually uh, under control. Thank you very much. Bill, can you, can you, from that, bounce a little bit to your area and your, your sort of different ways of developing capitalism in your investment? Yeah, I mean, just to uh, give a little bit of context related to this point specifically, um, to start, we're, in addition to TPG Growth, I'm the uh, co-founder of the RISE Fund, along with people like uh, Anne, who's up here, Bono, Mo Ibrahim, um, who's very involved in corruption, Jeff Skoll and others, and through those... The prevention of corruption. The, the, sorry, <laughs> involved in preventing corruption. Very good catch. Yeah, he would not have forgiven that. me that. He would not have forgiven me that error. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ann. Um, the, the, uh, the, in, in, in the context of both the RISE Fund and our growth business, we invest in, in markets around the world that, that I'll, I'll leave unnamed, but have perfected the art of corruption um, in, in many respects. Interestingly, in the private sector, if you're outside of the realm of where government is involved, even in the context of those markets where corruption is a, is a major problem, it often doesn't occur in private business. Um, we're able to find great entrepreneurs that are building businesses and often the transparency that, uh, that, that prevents um, and retards corruption comes out of those very same entrepreneurs that are building businesses on the back of uh, mobile uh, uh, tel telephony, uh, Sunil's platform on uh, blockchain, on, on uh, software as a service, cloud computing, AI analytics, big data. So we're, we're seeing tremendous uh, progress, both developmentally in the effect it's having in these local markets, but also specifically around transparency and, and supporting good governance, what uh, Mo Ibrahim is all about, transparency and governance. So if you, if you looked at the, at the ranking in the Ibrahim index, you would intuitively say below sort of the top 
10%, we shouldn't be investing given the governance uh, dynamics inherent in these countries, but that's just not the case. You can find great businesses in countries that are clearly way down that list from a governance and transparency perspective that are doing business in a extraordinarily laudable way, building great businesses that are in fact aiding the journey uh, uh, toward transparency. Can you describe how they go about it? Well, it's, it's different by company, but if you, you know, we invest across education, healthcare, financial services, food and ag. An example in, in Nigeria, one of those countries I'd say is challenging in many, many ways, is a company um, called Cellulant uh, that set out to develop a platform that could create a direct link between government aid, about $500 million a year, in government subsidy for small stakeholder farmers who represent, by the way, 75% of the world's poor are these small stakeholder yeah. farmers. Direct connect between that $500 million a year and 7 million farmers. <clears throat> Historically, that 500 million became 45 million by the time it got from the government to the intended small stakeholder farmer. They went out and because they were concerned about surviving this journey, mm. they hired 16,000 people, moved very quickly to build a platform based on blockchain that looks a lot like Adar in, in India, mm -hmm. a digital identity solution that allows those subsidies to be transported directly to the 7 million end farmers. It, they, they brought other value add services, education, training, microloans, et cetera, to these farmers, and then ultimately built an offtake solution so that companies like General Mills uh, could buy directly from those 7 million farmers. The net effect is a 30% uplift in household income, which in the context of these small stakeholder farmers is unbelievable. And this is all happening in a private context. So there, there's a blended government-private relationship there that becomes one that's transparent, that's additive, that's reinforcing, that's productive, and durable. Um, and, so the and that, 500 you know, million, was it 500 million? 500 million dollars a year. So they something. resurfaced? Well, it's back to the 500. And by the way, the 500 is now going directly to the yeah. farmer. We saw this with what's happened in, in India, you know, with, with Nanda Nilakani's and the government's efforts around, you know, again, digital identity. When you get rid of these kinds of, these kinds of platforms, which are really private sector driven uh, technology adopted by government sector, have the potential to be completely transformative. And we're seeing that in education, we're seeing it in healthcare. So this, this, there, there is an opportunity using the innovation engine of capitalism uh, when directed in a way that brings a moral lens to bear. There is an opportunity, uh, if measured properly and if held accountable, to be transformative in all of these markets in a way that's frankly critical if we're gonna get to the $30 trillion needed to, to achieve the sustainable development goals. Right, okay. Um, before was, I said a mouthful there. <laughs> um, and I'm going to come back to you about the integration and how uh, private financing comes into play to structure and help and, and uh, engineer investments. But because technology was mentioned so much, and before I, I, I will come back to you on your philanthropic role as well, tell us a little bit how you see technology playing that impact which Bill has just described, and, and how can we go further and do more? You know, very clearly, I, I represent the developing world here. Uh, some of the markets that I operate in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and even parts of India, are truly the places where uh, SDGs have the true meaning. I mean, they're directed towards those very people mm. that uh, are there in abject poverty, without education, without clean water, without basic necessities that the world uh, takes for granted. And uh, I'm very happy that this panel is being set up and you're cheering it. A lot of money is required, five, bill, five trillion to seven trillion a year, out of which 60, 70% is to be directed towards developing world. Mm -hmm. And the monies that are coming through are woefully inadequate compared to those numbers. Uh, the ODA uh, just topped up at $160 billion and doesn't seem to be a major uh, urge for uh, Western world or the countries that are rich to give more money uh, into their program. So we'll have to find our own solutions. And when you come to our local solutions, domestic markets, there are few things that can be done, redirecting subsidies. Uh, Prime Minister Modi asked all the rich people to give up subsidies that they receive on a variety of items, particularly one called out item was domestic gas. Mm -hmm. 
And millions, tens of millions of people have given up subsidies so they can be directed towards the poor. And more focused and program subsidies will be one way. We're raising some domestic bonds, green bonds, uh, some of the uh, blue bonds that are coming up in countries which are more fishery associated. Our small capital pools that will come through. So what do you do when you have a target of SDGs to be met by 2030? And if you're talking about big items, uh, eradication of hunger, poverty, providing education, sanitation, clean water, there's a lot to be done. And money's not there. Mm -hmm. So I, this is where my other hat, I'm, I'm, I'm chairing the GSMA, which is a global telecom body, in addition to ICC, uh, where I'm the honorary chair now. I think technology holds the key. Very clearly, technology holds the key. key because that can mitigate the absence of capital. Uh, the, the minister from Ghana talked about it. A physical touch to deliver all those services is impossible. So you have to digitize your uh, economies, which uh, most of the emerging markets, thankfully, are doing it. And my industry, the mobile industry, is the is the real, uh, I would say, champion in providing that last mile connectivity to hundreds of millions of people in each country. In India, nearly a billion people are now connected. You put a smartphone in their hand, it's a powerful computer. Uh, it's now down to $50, so it's in the realm of affordability. And then you start to put fanciful stuff in that. Um, 250,000 education apps are now sitting in the cloud for mobile phones, a quarter million apps. Uh, to build physical schools, which we all try to do as much as we can, is never going to be possible, especially by 2030. But it doesn't need to be done anymore. We can't have bank branches enough for financial inclusion. You don't need to do it anymore. Your little phone is a, is a bank branch now. Financial inclusion, um, uh, health bulletins, um, tertiary um, uh, health care, secondary health care, education, <coughs> a lot of stuff can now be delivered through mobile phones. And within that, we see, as you know, uh, women are the even more marginalized in our societies where their access to technology is limited. And I'm glad the GSMA uh, is uh, uh, spearheading the Connected Women program. I don't know whether the report has been launched today or will be launched during the day. Uh, sometime during the day in the UN, they will be launching this report, Connected Women. All of us, <coughs> mobile industry, Sigbe Breke is here from Telenor, I can spot him. Many of us who work in the developing markets are focusing on that as well. Put a phone in the hand of uh, a woman, a man, poorest of the poor, connect them with uh, massive amounts of data at very affordable prices, and then you start to see the magic of technology start to happen, innovation coming through. There are so many people out there building frugal innovations to provide all these services. I remain very <coughs> hopeful. The only thing I would like to um, say here, especially uh, since you meet a lot of uh, leaders from my emerging world, mm -hmm. Telecom industry is taxed almost at par with tobacco. Sorry, say that again. Telecom industry, mobile industry, taxes are at par with tobacco in most of the countries. If this is a platform to mitigate absence of money and accelerate the achievement of SDGs, why can't it be adopted as a vehicle to deliver precisely that? All we are saying is just take care of our load that you put on the industry. We want no money. $500 billion will be invested in the next five years in building more mobile networks. More 4G networks, more 5G networks, it all come from private sector. We don't need any money. But for God's sake, don't tax us heavily. That's one uh, demand we will have from the uh, leaders like you who have a voice who can talk to uh, the leaders of various states, and that's what we'd like to deliver. Well, I know that the granting of licenses is one moment when the uh, Minister of Finance, and I was one of those, uh, are sort of, you know, preparing for the big collection. So I, I hear what you say. I don't know how you substitute it, but it's, it's a very valid point that you're making. And in, in your um, position and with the very significant portfolio that you manage uh, with, with great wisdom and focused on development uh, in particular, what special know-how brings uh, a bank like Bank of America in order to integrate various sources of financing? Uh, it's um, RISE, uh, for one, it's philanthropic money, it's private company, it's banks as well participating in that. Right. So um, I think what we applied is to sort of the tenets of uh, the financial industry, which is risk and reward. And um, 
uh, for a commercial bank, if you're willing, what we learned um, several years ago, uh, 10 years ago, was if we could apply um, uh, what we were doing generally to the environment, which was then a risk uh, to be investing in renewables, wind, energy efficiency, solar, et cetera, uh, we, what we found is if we could partner with others, we could reduce the risk and we could um, agree on, shall we say, the margin. So in a case, um, so that we learned it through our environmental work. And 10 years ago, we made a $20 billion commitment, and I honestly was unsure of how we would ever do it. And within uh, three years, we were done. So uh, the business obviously began to accelerate. We then made later a $125 billion commitment, of which we were halfway through. But with it, we learned so much that we could apply in a broader uh, spectrum, basically the uh, sustainable development goals. And that is, can you find other, organ other financial organizations, each of us with a different risk and a different reward um, profile? So in the case of uh, what Bill is talking about, private equity obviously wants a higher reward, but they're willing to take a higher risk and they want a shorter time frame. A development bank will take um, from f first loss. Uh, Philanthropy will take first loss. A commercial bank has a very long horizon, wants lower risk, but is willing to take quite a modest return. If you can pull that all together, and we have many projects that we have now subsequently done, whether it's a wind farm in the North Sea or 30,000 uh, panels of solar in Spain or a land trust in parts of Africa, in each case it required philanthropy, a development bank, commercial banks, uh, family offices of wealth, and private equity all to join, each one of us with a different risk um, horizon, each one of us with a different expectation in terms of return, but all of us interested in uh, outcome. What would be the outcome? Mm. So you were g getting in for a certain reason, and then you're very eager to see an outcome. The environment is easier, but we've been able to do it with water, uh, which is related, but we have um, helped stand up a uh, water equity fund with um, water.org, which is Gary White and Matt Damon, who uh, have raised $50 million. We were the first $5 million guarantee. Um, and it is to give micro lent, to create micro micro lending at the grassroots level uh, to allow women, particularly women, but families, to have running water for businesses and families at a very low interest rate. They have a 97 percent return on this. It works. So we have just applied that, whether it's uh, capital to women, uh, uh, continued with environment affordable housing, water, et cetera. And the newer entrance into this in the private equity world makes it more attractive to more people. And if what Bill is doing through Rise Fund and a commercial bank, now we are talking to development banks trying to take what we've been doing at the bank to scale with um, world-known uh, brands, it's really made a difference. But the risk can only be medicated if the governments are also participating, hmm. because otherwise we just can't get buy-in. Okay, so packaging, catalyzing, addressing mm -hmm. the various um, range of the, the risks and the returns. Um, it's my all hands on, de on, on deck that you are actually putting yes. together. Does that result into a new financial kind of security or financing instrument that has a special that is a special category or, or is it every time tailored to a project to a country to a category of countries well every time it's uh, bespoke however I'd say that the um, mechanism of green bonds has been a pretty good proxy for what we could do right. and a green bond for I'm sure many of you know but it essentially is the same as a, mun a municipal bond it is to underwrite something that has a green value to it it can't be greenwashing because you must report on it so you must demonstrate what it is that has served as a pretty good proxy for other instruments um, that we can syndicate so that's been kind of a breakthrough. Right. And when you say we need the government, uh, the Minister of Development and Planning is right here from Ghana. What do you need from him? 
Well, I think Bill would say the same. What we need is some sense that when we're doing a project that uh, when we're bringing in investors that what we've gotten them to agree to and what we say the return will be that the government will not be so volatile as to uh, displace all the plans we've made, which is very difficult to do because even today's government may be different than tomorrow's. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for mechanisms to, um, shall we say, smooth that out. And what Bill were, was talking about and um, you were talking about earlier, Mr. Mattel, was is the transparency of technology of being able to go straight to the customer so that it's at least on record really makes a difference. Mr. Minister, it goes a little bit back to my initial question. How do you collapse the short, medium term into the long term and guarantee that those well-financed investments are comfortably settled in the country irrespective of changes? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in, uh, that is where there, is, there seem to be some <coughs> element of conflict between democracy and, 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 and maybe financing. See, now, I wasn't suggesting that all leaders should stay until the end of their <laughs> life in their position. No, no, no. So we, we have a four-year mandate and there will be election by all means. So something will change. So, and, and, and of course, as he rightly said, you know, it's very scary when new governments are coming in, especially in where I come from. But then I think what we can do is, uh, um, in, in Ghana, what we are trying to do now is to really have uh, a PPP arrangement, uh, a law that is backed by parliament. That is not actually something that it comes from the executive only to ensure that there is some continuity once it goes through uh, parliament. And also, I mean, some of these uh, businesses, um, uh, the contracts and arrangements that we have with other, uh, the private sector should all the time go through parliament to ensure that there is a buy partisan uh, uh, support for it. So that you bring the, op the opposition effectively you, into exactly. the fold and have Bringing them approve them in it. And, and, and in Ghana we debate it a lot. It's actually, when you get there you see it as if we are fighting each other. But the point is that you know there has to be a process that will actually ensure that people, both sides of the, of the, of the aisle, actually buys into that. Once that is done, I think it's, it reduces uh, a little bit of the risk and uh, mm. involved in maybe government changing from one area to the other. But for me, what I have seen is that, you know, it depends also on the project itself. Mm. We have started a project, of course, that, that is not a, a commercial one as such, but we are trying to uh, make a, a free senior high school education mm -hmm. to, to everybody else. And the people are thinking that, oh, this government is the one that is introducing it, and it's likely that it may, uh, when another government comes in, probably they will change it. But what I usually tell them is that, you see, look, <laughs> if the project is something that has no political color, if the project is something that, uh, if you are building a road from A to B, I mean, it's not only this part of the party or the other part of the party that uh, uses that road. So the nature of the, uh, the, the, the project itself doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to have political colors. Once that is removed from it, you know, continuity will, 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 be, uh, is, uh, will, will not be denied. So I think it is the way the, 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 the project is uh, perceived, and then, of course, the extent to which the process is transparent when you are putting it together. I know there are certain projects that went through a lot of uh, 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 high-profile uh, institutions, but the, 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 it wasn't transparent enough. And that thing is, there is, it, it, it is actually not on, on the other side of the Atlantic, but it's also from other side too. And that one is something that we should look at it very carefully mm -hmm. to ensure that you know, when, when projects are put together, there is a, 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 a transparency in the whole thing from both sides, and that uh, this element of uh, corrupt practices do not actually make. Once you have them in, mm. the new governments come in and they already want to change it. So I think the type of the project, the way that it is handled, and of course the fact that it goes through parliamentary process can uh, ensure that there is uh, some continuity in mm. 
whatever that you are doing. And of course, I, I know this PPP arrangement, I'm also a little bit skeptical about that because once, if it, is, it doesn't go to parliament and it stays only with the executive, a private, public, and the public is only executive, there can be a problem. Mm. So it has to be uh, get a buy-in from uh, the parliament as well. Bill, can I turn to you because Anne mentioned the risk rewards, uh, risk return. I know that you have very precise ideas about how to measure and how to determine what's a good project and what can, can actually be financed with success. So what we're trying to pioneer, and it, it took years of work to do this in partnership with um, a lot of uh, institutions, universities, uh, impact players uh, around the world, foundations and others, um, to do bridge span being part of this effort from the beginning as well uh, was figure out if there was a way to actually measure uh, impact so that when we talk about returns we're no longer as a society just simply focused on risk return which is the traditional metrics that we in the investing world think about but instead looking at risk return and impact and ultimately uh, our ambition would be that over time impact investing is no longer uh, a, a discrete 1% of the investment world, but rather it becomes a standard part of the way we think about all investing. Because as a, as, a, as a simple fact, every investment has an impact. It's a question of the degree of impact. Is it positive, is it negative? And it also do, it doesn't have to diminish what the return would be. No, that's right. Agree on it. That's, the, that's the second point of the RISE Fund and our effort there. And we're now, it was just in the- Can, can the you just specify that? Yeah, a, a, Anne's point, which is critical, is that the, the outcomes that we're talking about um, measuring the social and environmental outcomes, which ultimately tie back to the sustainable development goals, do not in any way compromise return. In fact, it's sort of an obvious point, but if, a, if the output of a business is that which is creating the impact, so I'm a healthcare provider, I'm a technology solution, I'm providing education, by definition, the more successful that company is, the more output they create, the more impact that is created. And what we've been able to demonstrate to date by looking at the, at the both impact and financial returns that we're generating is that collinear relationship that Ann was just referring to is inherent. There's a collinear relationship there. And it gives you a lot of hope because if you look at the, at the two and a half trillion dollar a year gap today that exists in the sustainable development goals, we're not gonna get there with philanthropy and government alone. There just aren't enough taxes and aren't enough Philanthropy, the, the, the Gates Foundation is less than one and a half percent of the first year's gap that exists in the Sustainable Development Goals. So what we need is to activate the $200 trillion that's currently active in the investable universe, corporate balance sheets, and, and direct those dollars against achieving these outcomes, which can only be done, to your question, if we measure them. Yeah. If we can actually create a third party uh, accountable <laughs> measurement solutions. So that's what we've set out to do. Mary Ann Hancock's here in the room, who's CEO of our RISE Labs, which we've set up as a separate, separate entity, public benefit corporation, to do this for everybody, because ultimately uh, the, the bane of our existence as a human race is our inability to measure externalities. And to the extent we can get to a place where we collectively, across government, philanthropy, and, and uh, the investing world can agree on how to measure these externalities in a quantifiable, rigorous way, it will truly be transformative, I think, in the way the private sector and, and in general capital gets allocated. Mm. And in, that, in doing so, you will measure the negative as well as the positive Negative as well as positive, it's critical. Right. You have to yep. give a net, we have to understand a net number and, right. and, uh, and ultimately every business has a combination of positive and negative uh, externalities. So as applied to returns, if I move that to my GDP, yep. Uh, it's a little bit, what you're saying is that if we were to measure properly and include both positive and, exter and negative externalities to GDP, it would probably mean that well, GDP a, it, would increase. Well, totally. It's a totally different, I, I, you know, if you look at the way we allocate capital as a society, I, I've, th that you see different numbers, but roughly 65% of all healthcare dollars in the United States are committed to the last six months of life. Yeah. What's the return on that investment? relative to our investing against early childhood education, a smart grid, uh, climate, growth infrastructure. It's a fascinating question. We don't ever think that way. And these investment allocations are left to politics and religion. It would be fascinating to imagine how we would all react 
if we simply looked at the relative good of these different choices that we're making in a way that was truly credible, third party, rigorous, which is the key to all of this, that it not be a tummy rub, which is what it's been historically, but instead that it be founded in a rigor. tummy rub? A tummy rub. Yeah. Okay. That's a California colloquialism. <laughs> Okay. Forgive the foreigner that I am sometimes. <laughs> and you wanted to, to... I would just add to what Bill is saying. However, the return is not always going to be a market return. However, if you can get a group of people in, um, uh, financial institutions in, where we in aggregate can agree on what the return is going to be. Obviously, if you have a Rockefeller Foundation, the return they're looking for is what was the impact, not the money. Uh, development right. Bank is uh, very patient money. A uh, commercial bank will accept low return, they just look for a lower risk. And then you move up, uh, uh, family, uh, family offices, wealthy individuals who can come together and believe in a particular subject. They want some return, but they may agree on something within their portfolio that looks like a fixed income, which would be 3 or 4%. And then you have private equity. Which when is you, egregious returns. Which is egregious, but, but <laughs> market returns. We have found, we have done this, and it works. If you how, how do you bring people together and get them to agree? Because some of them have to concede, some of them have to compromise, yes. some of them have to take a longer-term approach. How do you do that? You show them some successes, and I think success begets more success. And I think this point, and Anne was a pioneer in this area too, when you talk about impact in a quantified way, right. that allows you to make these trade-offs. When you can start saying, look, I'm... The, for every dollar we invest in the RISE Fund, we're delivering you a 12 times multiple of money on measurable, auditable, <clears throat> reportable impact. And prove it. And, right. and, and it's right. prove it. It's not our word. It's third party. People can start making interesting trade-offs of so where, where they choose to allocate their capital. Because most of the capital in the world is sitting in bank accounts, uninvested, unused, doing nothing for the world. And it creates an interesting imperative when you see the correlation of impact and, and, and social outcomes. Thank you very much. I'm going to close with you, Sunil, because you just recently uh, pledged to donate $1 billion. And uh, clearly, you're one of those essential contributors from the private sector and from your own personal uh, pocket. You decided to focus on education and education in the poorest of the poor countries. And you are particularly uh, keen to make sure that girls in particular, have access to education. So tell us a little bit about that project of yours, and then we'll close this session, because I'm told that I'm winked at. <laughs> well, you know, all of us entrepreneurs get inspired from <clears throat> success of others and what they do. And uh, one, uh, when, we, when you do well, you are asked to write a lot of checks. And we decided what we do best is organize projects, run projects, manage projects. So rather than just writing checks, let's pick up one subject in which we go all in. We saw Bill Gates going in for fighting diseases, and many others have done different programs. We picked up education because of its impact to be a multiplier in a society, especially in India where there are very young children. I mean, India is a very young nation, and uh, villages don't have access to school. Even if there are schools, they're not working. Uh, we decided, therefore, to go and build schools. We have built 270 schools, primary schools. Now the program of secondary schools are building up. And by the time the children start to come out of secondary schools, we want a university to be ready, and that's the big grant we've done now. But you said that technology is the key and you don't need to build anymore, so. Yeah, so uh, you're right. But within those, uh, I, you have to still get community going. And these schools are not fancy schools. They're basic schools in villages and not- To learn uh, to read, right? Yeah, also, do, it's also you can you know, do a lot of teaching through digital technology now, and we are supporting it. IBM is a part of the program, Google is a part of the program but you need to get children in. And these are little five-year-old kids coming into school. They need to just get going first. And these are primary schools mainly. 300,000 very little poor children, mostly girls, are in these schools. They you know, take away technology as they grow older. They start to use technology. Uh, but when you go into higher levels, India needs to generate its own brain power. I think we want to create a very high quality tech university, which will again be a different university where you're not just rotating in the classes, but you're doing a lot of technological in interventions. You could be sitting under trees and cafes, and you could keep on doing your stuff on tablets and all. That is the vision of our new university. Uh, we have got tremendous support from the American leading institutes, which we very much admire. And uh, hopefully, we would have made a small difference in our countries that we operate. 
But you also operate in Sub-Saharan Africa. Absolutely. It's India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, to all our panel members, please, a big hand out. <laughs>